Good afternoon. I'm Rebecca Marquez, uh, Business Intelligence Coordinator with PMMI, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar on trends shaping the meat, poultry, and seafood packaging and processing industries. Over the next hour, we will listen to the findings of this report by author Donna Ritson with DDR Communications, where she will discuss what's current, what's new, and what's changing. President of DDR Communications, Donna founded the company 25 years ago. DDR's business is based on a direct response methodology that delivers market research, business development, strategic alliance and marketing intelligence to companies in virtually every business-to-business -business industry. DDR's experience is backed by over 35 years in marketing communications. A few housekeeping notes before we get started. Everyone is muted throughout the webinar. If you have any questions that you would like to ask the presenter, please type in your question in the chat box that is located in the bottom corner of the screen. At the end of this presentation, which will last approximately 45 to 50 minutes, Donna will be able, excuse me, available to answer your questions. At this time, I would like to hand the webinar over to Donna Ritson. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you all for joining uh, today's webinar on the meat, poultry, seafood industries. Um, it's a very dynamic report, and I do encourage all of you to actually download the report. But today I will go through the highlights that are in the report and help you understand um, what kind of benefits this information will provide. Overwhelmingly, the meat, poultry, seafood industry is automating processes. Um, they are uh, human contact and contamination are, are two things that um, continue to cause problems, particularly, obviously, in the meat, poultry, seafood industries. Um, you'll hear more about automation throughout this entire report, but also be aware that PMMI is um, in the final stages of delivering an entire report uh, solely on the subject of automation. But we'll hear about it a lot here in meat, poultry, seafood as we go forward. I'll give you an idea of who we talked to, whose voice is in this report. Um, we had 50 interviews, and we researched 110 secondary references that help support and um, bring attention to some of the key industry uh, concerns and challenges that we hear about in our interviews and read about in all of the press throughout the industry. We talked mainly to large companies, um, but certainly a handful of medium and small companies are represented in this uh, report. We talked to people in manufacturing and operations, engineering, maintenance, um, both processing and packaging ends of the line. We talked to senior level management and some people in procurement as well. And we talked to, um, in each of our reports, we do try to talk to the top industry leaders. And we've talked to the top four out of five in meat poultry, the top eight out of the top 40 in meat poultry as well, and the top um, two out of 20 in fish and seafood. And this report does um, encompass all the different types of meat, poultry, seafood, and fresh, ready to eat, frozen, deli, canned, and individual quick frozen foods as well. So it gives you an idea of whose voice this is as we go forward. Um, we have taking a look here on the left-hand side pie chart. It's a 227 to almost 228 billion dollar market when you evaluate that as total value of shipments. The largest segment of this market is animal slaughtering, um, and it's described in much more detail as to what all this encompasses in the actual report. The next category um, is meat processed from carcasses, and then the last small sliver in the meat industry is meat byproducts. Poultry takes up a little over a fourth of the entire market, and seafood is um, a much smaller market, um, taking up only about 5.2% when you look at the, the total market of these three segments. And when we look at the um, why we talk to a lot of the leaders in this market, in each of these industries, 
the leaders, all except for seafood, make up a significant portion of the industry. The top five meat, poultry, I mean, the top five meat companies make up about 75% of the industry, um, located mainly in California, Texas, and obviously the Midwest. Poultry, the top five poultry industry leaders for ready-to-cook chicken account for um, over half of the industry. Again, California um, ranks top, and Texas are the two top states for all of these industries, with a higher concentration in the southern states for poultry. Um, for seafood, the top 50, it's much more um, fragmented, uh, or, or I should say smaller, um, companies that make up this industry. Um, so the top 50 make up 75% of this industry. And again, California and Texas are very high in this, uh, in this industry, and as well as you would assume um, along the coasts um, is where the uh, major companies are located. And we look at distribution a little bit. Club stores have gained uh, share and distribution for meat, poultry, and seafood purchases which is only a slight shift away from your traditional grocery stores um, and some of the specialty stores that are uh, continuing to arise. So when we look at the meat, poultry, seafood markets, um, they're really looking, and you'll continuously hear this throughout the presentation, they're looking to improve sanitation. Obviously, meat global demand, it's increasing, it's increasing for all food products and to minimize labor, and we hear this continuously in all industries as well, the difficulty in finding labor, retaining labor, training labor, um, the meat, poultry, seafood industries are looking at those uh, and facing those same challenges. Um, when we look at the, the outlook, though, it's the, the meat, poultry, seafood industries really are positioned well to um, move into automation um, and answer consumer preferences of just healthier food, smaller portions. Um, this is, again, much covered in the full report. And the technology solutions, there really is a collaborative effort going on that we've heard of through the end users of working with the OEMs and suppliers to actively meet the customer needs and bring automation to this industry. Some of the global demand um, for food, certainly steady gains both in meat poultry, um, continuously here in the middle class developing in um, other countries, expansion of food safety regulations, particularly here in the U.S., but it's also a global initiative. Um, just global trade is continuing to increase. And for seafood particularly, um, it has helped the industry. We'll get into this a little bit more, but the origin naming of seafood has helped to revive that industry so consumers know where their products are coming from. And when we talked with end users as to where is the most costly element in their manufacturing, it continuously points at labor, um, hence the uh, drive towards greater automation. Now, when we look here, this is um, describing where automation is taking place currently and how will it evolve in the next five years. Um, when we're looking at this chart here in the middle, if you look at the now section here, it's um, about a third is operating their plants right now between no automation and a level of 10% automation. And another third is operating at about 20 to 30 percent of their um, line is automated. And in the next five years, um, that will begin to switch. The uh, automation percentage will continue to increase at each manufacturing plant. And about one of three plant locations predicts to be 60 to 90 percent automated in the next five years. That could expand out a little bit further into 10 years, um, and that gets into a lot greater detail when we um, start to look at the automation report. But this, if this follows the same trend as we're hearing in other industries. And at this point right now, when we talk to the end users, nearly every company that we talk to does plan to increase their level of automated machinery in the next three to five years. And that includes um, all of the 
data acquisition software that is also occurring to collect data, transfer data, interpret data. Um, we're using the term in this report broadly to mean um, both machinery and software automation. So how are they going to fund that? We talked about um, how are they growing, how are they, their significant growth going on in this industry. Um, nearly half of the companies that we talk to are growing from 3 to 10% annually, which is a significant growth rate in itself. And another 12% are actually seeing some major significant growth of 20 to 40% annually. And well, how are they answering that growth? They're really starting to look for solutions in uh, purchasing and procuring new equipment, looking at packaging changes. We'll get into this in a little more detail. There's new lines going in, or there's certainly line expansion going in um, at a lot of these companies. Um, I won't look at too many of these quotes, but a particular interesting one here was from a co-packer. They're going to be moving from zero automation to a level of 70 to 75% automated in the future. So there's some significant opportunities, and, and with that comes some challenges as companies are um, implementing and operating more automated equipment. So when we look at, um, again, here is 96%. We talked about this, are planning to advance automation. Looking at specifically where are they going to be automating, depending on the processing or packaging operations, um, about um, two out of five companies are looking to automate their incoming supplies. So they're going to be putting in automation as um, e these uh, the food products and the meat poultry products coming in the door. And then there's about a fourth of the companies that are going to be automating their slaughter and process areas. And the largest majority um, of companies, um, almost three out of four companies, are looking for end of the line. Um, and in some instances, that means moving to more robotics. And uh, about a fourth of the companies did specifically talk about uh, robotics being the solution that they're going to be looking for as they automate in the future. And again, there's um, some much greater detail in the full report um, that talks about this um, more specifically. So looking at how are they going to fund this um, operation in terms of moving into more automation and procuring capital equipment, um, half of the industry predicts that their budgets are increasing. Um, this industry particularly is um, looking at um, nearly half of them are going to be spending on processing equipment. And three out of four of them are going to be looking at spending on packaging equipment. So some tremendous opportunity here for both the front of the line and the end of the line. And what kinds of um, trends are driving these investments? Clean labeling, certainly, um, sanitary design, and again, just the automation advancements that are taking place, either um, replacing older equipment or just installing new equipment to automate a manual process. And some of the important influences that are driving this is just a lower cost of financing at the moment, um, increasing their output that's significant, as I'd mentioned earlier, across all food industries. Customer orders are increasing, overall growth in their company in general, and the age of equipment um, always does play a role um, in replacing equipment, and a lot of that then is going to more automated processes. What are they looking for in equipment in the future? Um, what technology advancements are end users looking for? Um, when they're evaluating new equipment, they're really going to focus on service cost and quality. Certainly no surprises there. Um, almost all of the companies that we talk to do specify customized equipment at some level. That brings a, a set of its own challenges in um, timely equipment delivery and just the communication between engineers at the building uh, as well as the end user, 
in terms of deciphering those specifications and what exactly is needed on customized equipment. End users are recommending some improvements um, to be focused on, certainly cleanability. That runs right in hand with this whole sanitation cleaning process. Um, improving operator safety and just flexibility and changeover, which is something that we, again, continuously hear in all industries as products are changing, SKUs are increasing, there's a need for um, highly flexible and fast changeover. Um, what kind of things are they looking for um, in general? Wash down vision components was something that was talked about frequently. Wash down in this industry, obviously, as all of you know, is, is paramount. Um, preventive maintenance guidelines and just remote access ready machines. Um, while a lot of companies continue to um, be hesitant in allowing remote access, we hear that that's going to continue to change and those channels will open up more and more. When we look at how are they measuring their performance, either through OEE or TCO, um, the, um, both of them are being used. Um, TCO, total cost of ownership, seems to have um, gained popularity a little bit over um, OEE just because the measurement is a little more straightforward taking the three primary costs of acquisition, operation, and maintenance, and then calculating that into a total cost of ownership um, over the long-term use of the machine. Um, but OEE also has um, its advantages, and, and companies are looking towards that. But in, in both instances, we heard a lot of this in the automation report when we got into this a little bit more specifically. Companies are really looking to, or, or end users are really looking to um, help them understand what these calculations are and look for some kind of standardization in, in the uh, outcome and the calculation of these. And PMMI has calculators for these, so certainly something that um, it's referenced again in the full report attached with a link to get to that site. What are OEMs, um, companies want OEMs to build into the HMI? Um, certainly real-time tracking, um, downtime metrics to the uh, software automation and data collection, um, hours log, looking for production counts, maintenance schedules, maintenance states. Um, they're looking for simpler and easier to use and operate machinery. It needs to be able to be disassembled and reassembled um, easily and quickly, and certainly online remote connectivity. So preventing human error is certainly one of the things we talked about as we uh, opened up this report. So in order to do that, they're looking for operator instructions and greater safety. Um, again, use, going back to the HMI, looking for that clear and concise um, information available right there more intuitive instructions, looking for almost push-button operations in some instances where it can be an easy plug-and-play. Um, also, companies are looking for limitations um, in accessing the HMI recipes so that um, people who are not authorized to make those changes um, are locked out of that system and some type of verification or validation to ensure accuracy and that the right recipes were chosen. Operator safety, just in, you know, in terms of general operator safety, barriers or sensors that can shut down if an operator has entered an area that is unsafe. Um, and again, just looking for less manual adjustments on their equipment, hence um, moving towards more automation. And training is always something that comes up in our conversations. Um, uh, it's continuously needed. It's, they're looking for easy ways to train new operators and retrain um, existing operators. And certainly as machinery advances and everything becomes more automated, just understanding how to operate, maintain, and um, connect those machines in the future. Again, here's machine cleanability. It comes up. It is the greatest challenge that we heard about. Um, 
again, what we talked about, the need to be able to disassemble and reassemble equipment very quickly. Uh, we asked and had discussions about um, do they have safety teams at their locations that are involved in these specifications, and for the most part, companies do. Um, IP69K washdown is often required. Um, not always required, sometimes it's the IP66 or even the IP65 standards that are required, but in all instances, um, sanitation and preventing contamination is paramount in this industry. Um, we'll move in here next to look at their cleaning processes. Um, four out of five uh, manufacturers um, are looking for more hygienic processing and packaging machines. Um, what they're looking for is 82% um, almost all of the companies, high percentage, four out of five, are actually specifying more hygienic machines even if that machine comes at a higher price. Um, they're, they're needing to have um, more CIP clean in place. It's not often um, enough in this industry. They, it will often require deeper cleaning processes beyond just CIP. Um, one another area they're looking at is the antimicrobial coatings for both food and equipment. We talked about this with the end users. There's really only a handful of companies that are even exploring or using it at this time. Those that are using it are finding it to be very successful, so something I would think that um, other companies will look to the leaders and um, begin to emulate that as another way to prevent contamination and keep food safe. Um, we talked about who is actually doing their cleaning process. For the most part, um, it's completed internally. Only one of four companies that we talked to were using third-party cleaning. Um, that is an area of concern, is um, having the crew and the um, uh, workers able to perform the cleaning processes accurately and thoroughly and consistently. So hence, again, looking for um, some automation in that area as well. So if we look at the changes in packaging and their changes in materials and shelf life, um, two out of three of the companies that we talked to are updating their packaging materials in general. Um, there was a shift towards some flexible, um, certainly more clear packaging as consumers want to be able to see their product in all of the food purchases that they're making. Um, close to half of the companies that we talked to were using both MIP, which is Modified Atmosphere Packaging, and um, combining that with vacuum packaging to extend shelf life. Um, and certainly that's being driven by a greater increase in case-ready products. About a third of the companies um, are using HPP, which is the high pressure processing. Um, again, I think that's something that is being used by some of the um, larger companies in the industry and having success with that as well. Um, good portion of more than half of the companies we talked to were looking for film improvements, um, less wrinkling, easier to handle, uh, a couple other aspects of film, certainly in the um, case ready, they're using a lot of film uh, with trays and looking for some improvements in that area. So when we're looking at getting closer to the customer, um, there's certainly, again, their single greatest concern is to not have contamination anywhere in their product. So when they're looking at um, their most critical concerns, um, it, it sounds redundant, but it, to me it says that it's, it's bigger than um, other topics that they talk about in the industry. Food safety is, is number one. Sanitation and just overall operational efficiencies, which we hear about in all industries, but food safety and sanitation in this industry is particularly high. Um, they're already regulated by FDA, USDA, 
um, FISMA laws, the Food Safety Modernization Act, while they do um, apply to this industry, it's not directly. They, they are already under some strict uh, guidelines that FISMA covers through the FDA and the USDA. Um, food safety, they're just looking to extend shelf life and deliver the best, uh, safest product they can, retaining the taste and the appearance and the look of food to the consumers. Um, they are operating under global food safety regulations as well. Um, product traceability, that's where a lot of the FISMA laws come in and just looking for greater seal integrity in a lot of instances to keep that food sanitary. They need to validate machine cleanliness, um, obviously prevent any type of bacteria, either um, listeria or other bacteria that can enter into the process, just looking to con eliminate contamination anywhere in the process. Operational efficiencies, obviously um, no surprises. Everyone's looking to maximize uptime. They need to keep up with technology. Again, the investment in automation will continue to occur. Um, they're looking at and struggling with rising feed costs. Animal feed costs are rising, and, and that is a challenge in the industry. Um, help, you know, it's a challenge in the industry with the profitability overall and just keeping a good workforce and a safe environment for their workers. So there's areas where the OEMs can certainly build lasting relationships with customers, um, looking at preventive and predictive maintenance plans and parts, and certainly any on-site um, access services that um, can help them understand how do they keep a cleaner, safer operating environment. So when we look at opportunities, one of the things we do spend time with in our interviews with the end users is understanding what specifically are they looking for? How can the machine builder help them achieve greater sanitary um, procedures, um, looking at customized equipment, certainly more intuitive and simpler to use equipment, and obviously as we talked and heard earlier, just equipment that is more flexible to operate. So they're looking for a, a higher sanitary equipment design, um, certainly focusing on um, the, the documentation needed to validate those processes, um, equipment that's specifically washed down and components that are washed down. Uh, we heard earlier in the presentation here, companies are willing to spend more on hygienic equipment they're going to need the, um, the regulation standards, IP69, 65, or 66 washdown standards, and vision equipment, particularly as a component needs to have washdown compatibility. When we're looking at customized equipment, they're certainly looking for a quicker response time, although it, there is an understanding that customized equipment does take longer. And communicating those specifications can be a challenge. They're aware of that looking for no hollow tubing, they need a solid frame, no harbor points, <coughs> and certainly customized equipment needs to have a ROI justification. Intuitive automation equipment, what they're looking for there, again, we talked earlier, um, intuitive HMI, being able to troubleshoot that machine easily, remote access machines, and any upgrades that have already been done in the industry and users are looking to have um, that shared with them so they can make those updates as well. And when it relates to flexible machinery, they're looking for just, again, a better design um, to be able to handy, handle a variance in package sizes and package styles. Um, we even heard um, comments in, in conversation about combining several operations into one machine, and keeping machines simple. The operators are not engineers, and so the machine directions and operations need to be kept uh, simplified to reduce any type of human error. And we, when we look over then here on the column in the right, opportunities to form stronger relationships, certainly sent around center around at the onset of a project. There's some very good detailed information in the report about that. 
um, calculating operating costs, helping them understand that, and providing technical training. The information that they're looking for at the onset of a project is to um, bring the data that they're needed, the specifications, the cost, the performance, the documentation at the onset of a project so that they understand um, how to begin to evaluate that equipment and um, implement it into their operations. And we do continuously hear about just um, understanding the end user's challenges to really understand the regulations that they're faced with in this industry particularly, again, around sanitation and cleanliness, um, come with experts that know these markets that they're um, facing, offer educational programs and consulting services that, that help everyone to get on the same page with what the um, challenges are and what they're faced with in their manufacturing facilities, and just help them understanding, as I spoke earlier on this, um, what is TCO, how do they calculate it, how does it stay consistent, OEE, um, how do they begin to look at the costs and what is involved in making the calculations for OEE. And again, for predictive and both preventive maintenance, um, pre pre preventive maintenance certainly is something that many of the companies are using. Predictive maintenance is growing in interest and they're going to need help understanding how that all um, is calculated and how what kind of standards are around that, that there's consistency. And then lastly, just really better training and understanding um, what all of this, you know, how to use this equipment, um, how to clean it, what are the cleaning protocols, what specific equipment capabilities can they use to reduce contamination, and again, um, being redundant but using the HMI as a, a really valuable training tool. And we did hear in the industry, um, it, the unknown is something in the meat, poultry, seafood that does, um, when we talk about keep people awake at night, um, it, it's the unforeseen bacteria that is potentially um, out there that how do we prevent against it? How do companies even you know, understand what's, what could plague their meat, poultry, seafood animals that could then be um, seen as the, as the food chain uh, begins to move through the processing and packaging that, that they just don't know about. It, it, it's you know, certainly nothing to be answered. It's just a, a great concern that if they've taken care of one bacteria, if listeria is out of their plant, what's the next bacteria that could move into their facility? And as I mentioned, downloading the full report, I highly encourage it. It's, it's packed full of information, um, really looking more at the advancements in packaging. It looks closer at the equipment procurement, um, what's needed, where are they increasing specifically um, by machine, um, regulations and standards. Again, we talked about this, but it's covered in more detail what some of the regulating industries and um, regulating bodies are that regulate this industry, and then how and what is the impact on manufacturing. Um, in the full report, all the references and um, sources that have been used as secondary research are cited and listed in the full report. So that brings us to the conclusion today. Um, I do thank you for attending. Also keep in mind that the PMMI Media Group has many different playbooks that uh, pertain to this industry on food safety, specifically end-of-the-line equipment, uh, packaging development and labeling, and um, are always a good resource for additional information in this industry. Uh, Rebecca, I'll turn this back over to you to see are there any questions or comments that uh, we can address here before we conclude our presentation. Donna, thank you for the insights that you've provided on this uh, latest report on trends shaping the meat, poultry, and seafood industries. We do have one question so far uh, coming from the audience, from the attendees. 
wondering if you could speak about some of the sanitation approval agencies that are currently out there. Hmm. Uh, I'm assuming that the question is asking beyond just the um, FDA and USDA um, and SQF is another one of the um, regulators in that industry. I, I, I'm not positive I understand that question, Rebecca. Um, sanitation approval agencies is not something we looked into. I would assume they're talking about agencies that are coming in um, and approving their sanitation processes. I would assume that would be, um, from our experience and from what we've heard, um, FDA and USDA are certainly working much closer together in this industry to um, enforce compliance with regulations and standards. Um, because in this industry particularly what's occurring is a meat processor might also be um, making soup in their facility. So that would fall under both FDA and USDA guidelines. So um, it, the industry is changing in that, that they could have more than one regulatory body um, looking and overseeing their operations. Okay. And we can, um, what I'm going to do is just kind of um, give a couple minutes to see if there's any other questions that are coming through. Um, so we'll give a moment for that. Yeah, I think you've got one more here. Um, we do have a question uh, about there being any PMMI documents governing what sanitary standards should be met for this industry um, in the form of a benchmarking um, report of some sort um, and how to design or construct uh, facilities against, um, let's see. Um, for this industry. Uh, th this question, I can actually uh, email the, the questioner about this with anything that PMMI has uh, currently, that we're currently offering to answer this question. Yeah, that I, th I'm sure there are. I, it, we didn't cite yeah. it um, in, our, in our last slide here. But very good question. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to leave them um, in the uh, text box in the bottom portion of your screen. And I would add, Rebecca, that um, as you bring this information back to the people in your company, if there are questions that arise um, after you've looked at this, webinar again or you're reviewing the full report, you certainly can get back to Rebecca or Paula with any questions you have specifically and we can address them um, you know, as quickly as possible. Absolutely. There is a question um, I did mention. There is a PMMI automation report that I did mention at the beginning. Um, that report is scheduled. I don't know if I can exactly answer that. Um, it will be completed um, and ready for review by the Intelligence Committee um, in the next week or two. And then shortly after that, um, that report, I'm assuming, will be released. It will be discussed at PAC Expo Las Vegas. Um, so that, that report is uh, in the next couple of weeks, I think we'd be safe to say that. That report, report is actually scheduled, scheduled to be released right around the show. Okay. And if there are any other questions, please feel free to leave them in the bottom text box located at the bottom of your screen. And there's one specifically there um, 
to be notified when that will be discussed at the show so you could answer that directly um, offline, Rebecca. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, I don't think we have any other questions, um, so I think we can conclude here. On behalf of PMMI, thank you to everyone for participating in today's webinar. Uh, as a final note, you will receive an email to complete an evaluation for today's webinar. Please complete the evaluation as soon as possible and let us know how we can improve our webinars in the future. Um, and again, Donna, thank you so much. And we can conclude our webinar here. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a good day.